It's Thursday, March 21st. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show. It is a hell of a day to talk ball, as it is every day, but especially on this day. And joining me to do that is the one and only Yahoo Zone, Charles McDonald. Charles, what's going on, buddy? I'm doing good. As we said before the show started, I've been catching up on some things, but I feel like uh, I have my life back again. I'm feeling much more relaxed than I normally am. I've gotten to see some friends that I hadn't seen in a few months that live in the same city as me. So that's nice. I'm having a good time. And uh, now we're we're on to like the final stretch of what I what I still call the football season, because, you know, it, I think it's 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 interesting. Like when you have friends who kind of exist outside of the space, they're like, oh, man. So like once the season ends, Super Bowl is over, like you're done working until next season. I was like, no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not even a little bit. I wish that was the case. Uh, but, you know, it, it's good to be back into like a, a normal routine and, and getting to talk about the draft for the next few weeks. Well, you mentioned it, buddy. That is what we are doing. Uh, This show has officially pivoted from free agency coverage now to draft coverage. And with that, I'm just going to give you all the programming note here for what we've got coming up until the NFL draft. So starting uh, this episode is our positional previews. But next week, we're going to have a new segment on the show, new episode on the show. So three episodes a week. Going up into the NFL draft, we're going to have something called Mock Draft Mondays. It's a bonus pod each week where I sit down with one of the top mock drafters in the industry to discuss how they craft their mocks. But more importantly, uh, just give me five picks from your mock that you really like. Because Charles does mock drafts, so he knows this. Feels like everybody that does mock drafts kind of hates it. It's a love-hate relationship. So I want you to tell me you know, the five things you love from your mock draft, player team fit, uh, anything that, that goes there. It's going to be pretty exciting. We have Nate Tice also from Yahoo on the first episode, so look out for that on your feed in uh, Monday morning. And then on Tuesday, we're going to dive into kind of the teams that shape the drafts. Uh, Excuse me, let me say that again. On Tuesday, we dive into the biggest themes uh, of this year's draft, sort of kind of a what we did with our teams that shaped the draft series last year, but this year, it's going to be more thematic. So top three picks, teams in the top 10 that don't need a quarterback, those quarterback lurking teams, teams that are loaded with picks. That's what's going to be coming on Tuesday and on Thursday. As you can tell from this episode, Charles McDonald is going to join us to break down the prospects you need to know at the skill positions starting today with quarterbacks. So Charles, it's draft season, baby. That is a lot of content, but I can't wait to get into these positional previews with you. Yeah, you, you jumped through a lot of places there. That was a lot, but I think it's good because it means we're doing a lot of work that people are going to be interacting with. And uh, as you said, Nate Tice, uh, one of my good friends, and we have been working on uh, some of these mock drafts together. Uh, and really with the with the mock drafts, I kind of like to do it where how many people can I irritate with this? Because I feel like most people, like they <gasps> they enter the mock drafts phase where they're reading stuff and they're learning about prospects and you know they come across a guy they don't like that's mocked their team and you know like a fan of like the Jets or the Giants will say my team would never pick a bad player in the first round they've never made yeah. mistakes so how dare you uh, so I, I think it's kind of fun so I like to troll like specific people sometimes so for mm. our upcoming mock draft that it should be releasing some point today this is Thursday March 21st perfect we have the Packers taking Oklahoma offensive tackle Tyler Guyton. And that's solely because I know my friend Justin Muscata does not like him as an offensive <laughs> tackle prospect. Um, so, you know, you get to scroll through the whole mock draft, you get down to pick 25, and you're a little irritated. Like, that's kind of what I'm going for here. Yeah. You know? This is this is why Charles is on the positional previews and not on the like mock draft methodology player to team fit. Like Charles is gonna come on there and be like, Yeah, my favorite fit is actually this offensive lineman to the Packers just to piss off justice. So like t- <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, there's there's a demographic for that. Uh, no, there's there definitely is. people th- there's definitely people that we're mutual friends with that appreciate you uh you know, pissing off justice. That's that's great, but it probably doesn't make for the best mock draft show. No, it doesn't. But I did get 49ers fans last week because they have the 31st pick. You scroll all the way down to the bottom. And the last one, I had the Patriots trading back into the first for the for Michael Penix at 31. And I got a bunch mm. of 49ers fans. Oh, I can't believe I scrolled down to the bottom of this mock draft and my team didn't have a pick. Like, uh, I don't know what to say, bud. <laughs> that, that might happen to you on Thursday night in a few weeks. So right. get ready for it. I'm preparing you for this. 
and it might be a good thing too. Right. I mean, shoot, of all the of all the things to get offended by in a mock draft, the fact that your team probably made a smart move and traded down, collected more future assets, more picks for Kyle Shanahan to burn on, you know, day two with a running back or a kicker or whatever, that's probably a smart thing. I mean, it, that it is funny. Just last thing before we we move right. on here, just about mock drafts, it is really funny that it's probably the lowest stakes thing that a fan could get irritated with because like it's one thing if you if you're a fan of a team and like I tell you that this receiver they drafted is gonna stink or you know like you see I've ranked this guy in fantasy way too low I I, I can understand even though like I mean come on I'm, I'm one person with an opinion go outside and touch some grass like don't get mad online about it but I can understand why that would irritate you but like this isn't even a th- thing that's gonna ha- like happen this isn't even a real thing it's a mock yeah. draft and like you're you're irritated about that i mean come on l- yeah, let's, if, let's relax you, here if you're irritated over a mock draft right wait until the real thing you know <laughs> yeah 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 because yeah, that's a great point like, oh, my team would never do anything stupid well just most wait of them do give it a couple of them do most most all of them do. Um, we got one piece of news here just to hit on really quickly before we do our quarterback positional preview. Um, since we last spoke, really the only thing notable that's happened is the Jets have agreed to terms with wide receiver Mike Williams, formerly of the Chargers, to a one-year deal worth up to, I mean up to, baby, the, the phrase of the offseason. It definitely applies to Mike Williams' contract, up to $15 million. Charles, I just want to a- ask you uh, about this because I know you've covered the Jets. You, you live there in New York. You're close to it. Um, I mean, are the 2024 New York Jets, who were already pretty like an all-in short window team, now they've signed Tyron Smith and Mike Williams to one-year contracts with incentives? Are they, is this the most all-in team that's ever all-in, the 2024 it, New York Jets? It's got to be because like you say short window, it's really just this season because mm-hmm. if things don't work out this season, then this whole thing's going to be blown up. I'm sure Aaron Rodgers will just retire and go on to do whatever the hell he wants to do. You're dealing with, like you said, one-year contracts for Tyron Smith, one-year contract for Mike Williams. This thing is it's pretty fragile because you're kind of doing the same thing you did last year to a degree, except you're expanding upon it where, look, it's not like the Aaron Rodgers who entered the season last year as a Jets starter he hadn't been the most healthy guy while he was finishing up his career with the Packers, you know, as he was getting towards 40 years old, dinged up with the, a bunch of like lower body injuries and um, didn't miss like too many games, but still was like hampered at times. But that was really like your biggest injury risk. Now you're expanding that to Tyron Smith, who misses a handful of games. Mike Williams, who we know has had injury issues and is coming off a season ender from last year. It's a little tough to see all of this working together for a full 17 to 21 game season. But at the same time, I will say if these guys are healthy and they're back to looking somewhat like quality versions of themselves, this is, this is a good offense for sure. Garrett Wilson, Mike Williams, uh, I think there's a lot of big play potential there, but it's kind of like last year where, you know, if, if guys start getting hurt and, and things fall apart, you don't really have too many things to count on. But I think, where they sit now with Mike Williams at uh, wide receiver two, it makes a 10th pick a little interesting for them because you don't have to pick like, uh, you know, if Romo Dunes or Malik Neighbors were to fall down that far, you don't have to do that. You don't have to consider trading up for one of those guys. You could maybe see right. Brock Bowers fall to 10. I think it gives you a lot of options there. Yeah, that that's really all you want out of free agency is you want flexibility, right? In the draft, in my opinion, like and and now that you have a potential starting receiver and a starting left tackle, you don't have to go in there, you know. Before the Tyron Smith deal is like, well, we got to take a tackle at ten, and then you sign Tyron Smith. It's like, well, now we got to just potentially trade up for one of those top three receivers or really hope one of them falls to us. And I don't see one of those. I don't see the third guy there falling past Chicago at nine. That again, just my opinion, but right. So now it's like you have that flexibility now that you add these two players, even though, yeah, you're right. The odds that Mike Williams and Tyron Smith both start 17 games, much less. And Aaron Rodgers, I would say. And and Aaron Rodgers. Like, it's pretty much, I think it's got to be, what, like 2%? 2% that you get lucky and and all those guys start all 17 games? I I don't think that's going to happen. But if you get 13 games out of one of them, like, that's that's fine. And really, the Jets had to do three things this offseason. 
Um, well, I guess four things. Hope nothing really crazy like Aaron Rodgers runs for vice president happens. So check. So f- one thing there. Two, they had to address backup quarterback. They did that with Tyrod Taylor. They had to address offensive line. They added two guys formerly of the Ravens, Morgan Moses and John Simpson, and then Tyron Smith. So check there. And then fourth thing, they had to get more playmakers in at wide receiver specifically beyond Garrett Wilson. Because like Malik Taylor, Alan Lazard, uh, you know, Xavier Gibson, that's Jason Brownlee. Like that was the roster beyond them. So Mike Williams, I think he really like I don't think Mike Williams is going to be a guy that I'm all that jazzed up about like projecting him out like his stats or fantasy or anything like that but having him as that X receiver does allow Garrett Wilson to move around Garrett Wilson told me at the Super Bowl two years ago like I I want to play all three positions I want to line up in the slot I want to be having those flexibility of running like two-way you know two-way go routes here like can you give me um give me the option to run a post corner that, that's the type of stuff he wants to do. You can do that now with with Mike Williams as that X receiver. And again, you can still can and should probably add at the position in the draft. So even though it's not risk free, uh, it's a, it's really leaning into the risk. I think this has been a good offseason for the New York Jets. Yeah, they've uh, they've they've filled some uh, they filled some holes. Right. So I, w- I would say you, you it, like they could peak out as the best team in their division, which I think is saying a lot with where the Bills and, and the Dolphins are uh, still with some of the top t- top in town on their roster. It just it feels scary. Like if I was Joe oh, Douglas, yeah. I would be I would be a little bit scared right now. I'm yeah. pretty, pretty nervous. Yeah, what are I you going to do? Like, are no- I'm going to say, what are you going to do? If you don't get it done this year, you're fired anyway. So you might as well go all in. Screw it. Trade right. up for Marvin. Why not? <laughs> I mean, shoot, didn't um I think Daniel Jeremiah had that in his latest mock, them trading up to the fifth pick to to get Marvin Harrison. Now, that was maybe before the Mike Williams deal. I don't remember, but still, I think it's possible. Why not? Like you should not only should you load this team up for Aaron Rodgers, if you are Joe Douglas and you are able to keep your job past this year, you want this to be an attractive landing spot for uh, another quarterback to get dropped in here at some point, too. So uh two ways that that can work out for you. But all right, that's enough Jets talk. Let's talk quarterbacks here. Let's get into it. Before we talk about each individual player, Charles, um, just kind of wanted to take your temperature on how you feel about this class as a whole, the strength of it at the top, the depth of it, um, especially compared to recent quarterback classes. How would you characterize this group of quarterbacks as a whole? Um, I think it's a good group. Uh, personally, I I put like Caleb and Drake a good deal higher than everyone else. I think they're, okay. they're kind of separated into their own tier. But, you know, I think we can start getting the guys like Jaden Daniels and uh, J.J. McCarthy and, you know, maybe even Bo Nix and Michael Penix to a lower degree. There's 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 opportunities for them to get better and for them to kind of develop in starting quarterbacks. But I think it's a little bit muddier for them than the, the guys at the top. Uh, so th- I think it'll be interesting ultimately where guys flip out because I are, you know, turn out because I know you start reading these mock drafts, especially recently, a lot of them have like Jaden Daniels at the second overall pick going to the mm-hmm. Washington Commanders, which to me seems nuts. But I'm sure we'll get into it on the show. I don't really know uh, like what is scaring people about Drake May, but I do think that yeah. when you start looking at just like the talent that he had around him, the kind of system he was playing in, uh, I think he was kind of in a similar spot from Caleb where you kind of got to be the the ace, the alpha on the team. And that means turning bad plays into good plays fairly routinely. And I kind of think that that experience is going to help both of them as they start, uh, you know, getting started on their NFL journeys. Okay. So yeah, let's talk about this top. I I grouped them into kind of buckets here, but I I had the top consensus three players because to me, it does seem like maybe you disagree with this, but typically around the industry, there's a top three consensus of Caleb Williams, Drake May and Jaden Daniels. And yeah, you're right. People do flip that order. I mean, shoot, I've even seen some people out on the Internet say that Jaden Daniels should be the first overall pick. Um, We'll get to we'll (laughs) we'll get to Daniels last (laughs) before before we dive into the players, just like my perspective here. I'm obviously coming to draft coverage later than Charles is like Charles. How, when do you start like watching prospects and when you start like, when did you start putting out mock drafts this year? Uh, I think I started. Well, those are two different questions. Okay. Like when did I, uh, when did I put (laughs) out my first, you know what? Just answer the second question. Just answer the second question. Uh, the first mock draft, man, probably sometime in like around Thanksgiving, the holiday Mm -hmm. stretch into Christmas. Um, 
But I mean, you know, I, much to my significant other's chagrin sometimes, I will sit on the couch on Saturday all day yeah. Yeah. and watch college football. So I, I already have a, an idea of what like this kind of looks like uh, when I'm starting to build the mock drafts. But yeah, I, you have to spend a lot of time actually going back to rewatching the games when you when you get to some of the draft stuff. So I, I've been watching these guys for for a long time. And obviously with guys like with Caleb and Drake, you know, right. Caleb's been on the scene yeah. since he was a freshman at Oklahoma. I watch a good amount of Drake May too because uh, I have some friends that are like ACC football stands. So we talk about that. And I'll, I'll catch up some games. So uh, I, uh, I've i known these guys for a while. See, now on my end here, because I'm a happily married man, I do not spend any time watching college football during the season. <laughs> that, that would be a very tough sell. I say it often. That would be a very tough sell to Mrs. Harmon to say, hey, uh, we are. We're, I know I ruin Sundays and Mondays and Thursdays and all, all the. So we're going to spend one more day on, on something that really has nothing to do with my job, but I just because I want to watch football. So I don't watch a lot of college football except some of the bigger games later in the season. Um, so really a lot of my experience with these players is, and, and I, you know, I'll watch some film on the quarterbacks, but a lot of the way that I interpret the quarterbacks is like through the receivers. Cause I've done work on almost all of these guys via like watching their receivers. So I'm pretty familiar mm-hmm. with these quarterbacks. Now, when we get to the running backs and some of these tight ends, we're going to talk about later. I'm, I'm not gonna have a whole lot to contribute to the discussion because <laughs> I am not going to spend a lot of my pre-draft time when people want me charting, you know, damn Javon Baker and all these like random receivers. I'm not. I'm not watching a lot of running back film, but I I do have opinions on these quarterbacks. So I'm interested to hear like where we kind of agree, disagree, like where we go away from the consensus. Let's start with Caleb Williams, though. Who you know? I mean, shoot, he had his pro day yesterday. Keenan Allen is there in his new Bears gear. You know, they're dapping each other up. Everybody assumes Charles that he is going to be the first overall pick. It seems like that is what's going to happen. In terms of like. Caleb Williams' game overall, how would you describe him as a player? What does he do well? What are the weaknesses? Let's get into the whole thing. Oh, man. He's just like dynamite playmaker, I guess, if if I had to describe him. Um, you know, I I think as we start to get this new newer generation of quarterbacks in, because you know, guys like Mahomes and Lamar, like they've played for four or five years now already. So like they're pretty entrenched. Uh into their careers, uh, you know, I'll throw Josh Allen to it. But we, we start to see guys who kind of play with the athleticism and creativity of the guys that they've grown up watching, which has become, um, you know, like Mahomes, Lamar, Josh Allen. Like those guys are starting to have um, their own little tree of players who kind of idolize them coming to the league. Um, and I think Caleb Williams is like one of the first guys that will come to mind if I was trying to, you know, build a quarterback that played someone like someone somewhere like that um he's like you know it, it's funny because i think when you watch caleb he looks like short shorter but uh like i said next to him at the combine he's a little bit taller than me and i'm six feet tall so i don't really think even the size is that much of, much, much of a concern he's he, i think he's bigger uh you know a bigger build than maybe you would think based on his height but like the exciting stuff is obviously the arm talent um right it's like the arm angles being able to throw it all over the field, uh, the arm strength, like throw it across the field. Like there's one play that he had against, um, I think I want to say it was Washington, where he's like scrolling out, he's like scrambling out to his right, rolling out, and like out the corner of his eye, he sees a receiver like on the left end zone, and he just rips it all the way across the field on a dime in tight coverage. I'm like, okay, like that's that's why you go. That's yeah. why you're you're considered the number one overall pick. And I think with Caleb, a lot of it has to do with the Mahomes factor of like, dude, how many teams from that 2017 draft, well, all of them, feel like, damn, didn't see the vision on Mahomes. Probably yeah. should have taken a flyer on just based on the arm talent alone. I don't think any team wants to be that team that says, oh, damn, pass on Caleb Williams. And he's making plays that only four quarterbacks can make uh, on a fairly routine basis. And, you know, I, I think there's some flaws with Caleb's game. I would say sometimes, you know, hold on to the ball too much. It's got a little bit of a Jameis Winston hero syndrome in him to a degree that oh, will probably get, it'll probably get punished a little bit harder at the NFL level than it did in college. But I don't, I don't, I think he's, he's so clean, got the off the charts arm talent. The upside is like infinite. Uh, he's got to be the number one pick to me this year. 
Yeah, my first exposure to Caleb Williams was at Oklahoma when I was working on Marvin Mims. Um, and just as soon as Williams is in there, it's just like, bam, this is different. Like yeah. some of those throws deep down the field, especially to Marvin Mims, because he was that guy in college that he would get those free releases from the slot and you would just you could fling that thing down the field, could Caleb Williams. So you saw the talent like immediately. It's enthralling. I agree with you that maybe he doesn't have um, – I mean, he certainly didn't have like a Josh Allen or like a Matt Stafford type of arm, like in terms of arm strength. But I think arm talent is the right way to say it. Like these, it, you know, it, the Mahomes comparison does suck because it's just like Mahomes is the best player I've ever laid eyes on at the quarterback position. He, you know, from a just what he can do perspective, it's just I mean, I've been calling him quarterback Jesus for years. Like he, he's just untouchable in that way. But how creative Mahomes can be as a thrower I, I Caleb absolutely has that. That's what you're looking for in a passer in today's NFL. Like I think you have to be able to to be a, a high tier, top two tier quarterback. You have to have that ability to to be a creative thrower from the pocket and from different arm angles, stuff like that. There's just a clear limitation when you don't have that as a quarterback. So I think Caleb checks that box. But I don't know, Charles. To me, you, you tell me if you think I'm wrong about this. I also think that when things um were on time and were which wasn't very often but when things were on time and on schedule and in the USC offense I actually think he plays well within structure it just there's so that that the opportunities were not afforded to him especially last year to really do that so I think there's definitely like that wild buck that you kind of have to or wild stallion that you kind of have to train a little bit in him but there do, there to me there are flashes of him actually being a guy that does play within structure like you want Oh yeah, yeah. He can he can do that for sure. Um, I, yeah, I think with with Caleb and you know some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL today, they're gonna look at this game like, okay, well, yeah, I can run this play as it's called, and it's gonna be easy for me. But I could also do something spectacular, right? You know, we see that a lot with Mahomes. We see it with Lamar Jackson. We see it with Josh Allen for sure. And you know, I, I think for for them or in the Bears, assuming that they draft him, it's going to be like, okay, how much of that do we want to squeeze out and how much do, do we want to dial it back in? Because you don't want to be, like, you don't want to become like just this robot quarterback, even though I, I think he can do that. You know, I don't think he needs to be a Jimmy G guy where I'm going to hold your hand every play and, you know, please run the play as it's called or else it's going to be a disaster. He, he's he's really got some otherworldly abilities. And I, I think that, you know... It, it, it probably hurt a little bit trading Justin Fields for a future six round pick um, because everyone knew you were about to take Caleb. But at the same time, clearing the runway for this guy, it makes all the sense in the world. And I think you just got to throw him in there next season, take the lumps for what they're worth, because the upside on, on what he can be is, is just astronomical. We're going to uh, have Derek Klassen on the Tuesday show next week to talk about the top three teams in the draft, you know, Bears, Washington, New England. Um, so I don't want to d- dive too deep into like how Caleb Williams would fit with the Bears, but just off the top, right? Like, I think they, because you, you said it really well there that you don't want him to completely give up that playmaker gene. I totally agree, right? You, at the same time, you don't want a guy, and I think this happens sometimes. If if he doesn't believe in the offense, and I come back to like Aaron Rodgers, especially in the, during the end of his time with the Green Bay Packers, it was just like he was actively rebelling against the offense on a you know week to week, down to down, series to series basis. Like sometimes that, and I think there was some of that last year with Caleb at USC at times where it's like, all right, I don't, I'm 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 out on this, I'm bailing on this, you know, completely. But I and I can get away with it, especially at the collegiate level, you can absolutely get away with it. Although he didn't always in college last year, so. I think, though, the Bears have built something in Chicago that with these two receivers, with the other guys they've invested in, where he should have some confidence and belief in what they're throwing out there from a talent perspective, for sure. And I think Shane Waldron's a pretty good uh, NFL coordinator, NFL pass game designer as well. Yeah, I I think the the fit's fine um, uh, with the Bears. And like he's he's lucky because they're not you know, yeah. they weren't actually the worst team in the league. You know, I think mm-hmm. this might feel different if. We're we're talking about like okay we're gonna put Caleb Williams onto the 2024 like upcoming Panthers offense which they've made some some upgrades but it's still looking to be a pretty pretty rough offense uh, I would say but you're walking to a, a team that has like you said Keenan Allen DJ Moore Cole Komet that's three veteran guys you can count on they brought in DeAndre Swift last year they spent a pick on um, Darnell Wright who was 
pretty damn good by the end of the season as a rookie, and he looks like he's turning the corner for real. Um, you've got a left tackle in uh, Braxton Jones who's playing pretty well, uh, especially for being a former fifth-round pick. Like This is not a horrendous situation to walk into. And on the flip side, after the Montez Sweat trade, that Bears defense was one of the best defenses That's in good. the league. Um, so I like if I'm a Bears fan, I'm like, Caleb, we might we might need to see playoffs year one. But <laughs> at the same time, it's 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 a good situation for him to walk into, for him to grow into. And and man, like I I I'm I'm just happy for the NFL that we have a talent a prospect as talented as as uh, Caleb Williams, who's not going to just some dog shit situation where no one's gonna succeed or or it's going to be tough for him. Well, I mean, it's going to be tough because it's the NFL, but, you know, relatively right. compared to what other guys are walking into. Totally. Um, just before we move on from Caleb Williams, I feel like we've mostly been positive here. Um, is there anything uh, kind of in his game where you're like, yeah, if this doesn't if this doesn't get fixed, like this could end up being what maybe not what makes him fail as a prospect, um, but could really hold him back from reaching that ceiling, I guess, because there's definitely a lot of, I don't know if I want to call it noise or, or whatever with Caleb, you know, there's, there's definitely some, there's the stuff with his dad. There's like, all right, people were all, you know, he cried after games, he paints his, you know, he paints his nails. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's wearing that dress thing on, on the cover of that magazine or whatever the hell that was. I I don't know. There's, there's a lot of stuff, right? Like with Caleb Williams, does any of that even matter or, or more so is it like, is there something on the field? I think is, is more what I'm asking. Like, Beyond all that stuff, like, is there anything from an actual football perspective that has you like, yeah, if, the, if, if this doesn't get worked out, this is going to be the thing that keeps him from reaching a ceiling? I I think really it's just going to be taking care of himself, like, in game. Um, hmm. Because, man, there's, there's, I know the USC's offensive line was not great last year. Um, I would say UNC, USC offense as a whole uh, is not great. Yeah. I remember, you know, our, our friend Deontay Lee, who does work at the Athletic, he's a big, USD fan and he was talking a lot during the season about how he thought Lincoln Riley had kind of fallen back as a, as a play call and it wasn't quite as um you know advantageous as it was while he was at Oklahoma or even the the Heisman winning season uh, that Caleb had uh, at USC but I think when you start looking at 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 his own characteristics Caleb like he's a guy who will hold onto the ball man he will um yeah. and I I think that you know like we've seen guys who play that style of game get dinged up, um, you know, from Deshaun Watson, Lamar Jackson at times. We've seen Josh Allen get injured uh, from time to time. Jalen Kyler, Hurts, I mean, Kyler, Jalen Hurts. Kyler's a pretty through. common comparison too. So that that is he's definitely bigger than Kyler, but yeah. from play style perspective. So I, the only thing I get nervous about is, you know, I, I, I think we, it's funny because we talk a lot about like, oh, these athletic quarterbacks, they're going to get hit running downfield when a lot of times they get hurt from like, okay, I'm going to extend this play and mm -hmm. see what I can do. Next thing you know, I have some 270 pound person from Mars who is faster than I am taking me out and I've got a dinged up shoulder. I've got a dinged up ankle. So I think he's going to have to, to, to do a little bit better job taking care of himself within the pocket. And uh, if he can do that, I really think everything else is going to be able to uh, come naturally to him and, and he'll figure it out. Like, like you said before, he get he uh, so many of his like exciting highlight plays are when he's extending down the field that you can see holy crap like the arm strength to be able to throw on the move and throw across your body but he he does play and structure a lot better than giving credit for. Yeah, I think he is a he's a net positive for guys like DJ Moore, for Keenan Allen, for any of these guys in year one. Like in Definitely. terms of getting them the ball and stuff like that, it's it's a net positive to be with. Caleb Williams as opposed to um, I mean shoot Justin did a good Justin Fields did a good job elevating DJ Moore to a pretty big season last year um, or maybe vice versa uh, so I, <laughs> I, but still <laughs> still I think that I think this is good news for all of these Bears offensive players all right let's talk about Drake May um, and full disclosure I I like Drake May a lot like when I was watching Josh Downs with UNC last year I just kept thinking like as I'm as I'm watching Drake May here, this is like set and forget it. I, I I thought this was like okay, Drake May set and forget it. I think it's going to be like a conversation between who's better, Caleb Williams or Drake May. That's how I thought this was going to play out. Here, you know, 365 days later, 
Charles, the conversation seems to be more like it's not even close with Caleb Williams and Drake May. As a matter of fact, like we said at the top, some people are now passing up, like J- Jaden Daniels has passed up Drake May. So tell me why that is the case. Like, why has why has the conversation or, or tenor around Drake May changed? Or was, am I just way off base here with what I'm seeing? Can I be honest? Yeah, sure. Um, Preferably, honestly. Okay, because like the Drake May stuff, dude, I can look at a Jalen Jaden Daniels box score, a list of his game logs and go, holy <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> Like, yeah, because he, he, well, because that's why I was every during the week, every season, like I'm I, w- I was trying to catch LSU games just for the spectacle of it, like because he was breaking records yeah. left and right every week. I think he was like the first player in NCAA history with 350 passing yards or 200 rushing yards in the same game. And that level of dying, like like that, like being that dynamic, it pops out to you from a box score page. Um, I think with Drake, man, sure. you kind of you kind of got to actually dig into the tape a little bit more mm-hmm. to see why people have been hyping him up as like this top three pick because dude like i i don't i i i i really hate like the supporting cast part of draft season but i do think it's necessary to kind of dive into and look into um drake may wasn't playing with the malik neighbors he wasn't playing with brian thomas um yeah. also lsu they have a left tackle will campbell number 66 he's going to be a top five guy or top 10 guy next year um you know, they they had the supporting cast that would, and, and they did, that would make any college defense absolutely hit their pants with fear because we don't have a, the talent on the back end or the front end to deal with um, just about all the things that, that they're giving us. But with Drake May, you know, you talk about like, I don't know if you've gotten to like Tez Walker charting. Um, I don't really see it with him yeah, all that no, much. No, no, I, uh, the offensive it, it, line was I do not bad. have. I do not have the same feeling that I had watching Josh Downs last year. Let's put it that way. With, right, with right, 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 right. Um, so you know, like you start looking at it like, okay, man, your your best player that you're playing with was like Tez Walker, um, and then you start looking at really over the past two years the workload that Drake May like had to carry by himself. Um, yeah. yeah, back in 2022, he was almost a 1,000 yard rusher for UNC, and you know, college football they count Saxon as rushing yards, so he's he's got more rushing production than you would probably think for 2022, 2023. Um, I think it was a little bit harder for him this year, but dude, you just gotta go back and watch some of these games and like see how many times he's being left out to dry by his teammates down the field on big play potential. I I, I don't think he's a perfect prospect. By any means, uh, but when you're talking about like big arm, he can run. He's accurate, um, and I think his upside is a lot higher because the the offense he played in at UNC is not going to resemble anything that you see at the NFL level. Uh, it kind of reminds me of like uh, like the old Art Briles like Baylor offenses where oh my God they're putting up a hundred million you know yards a game, but none of the receivers ever hit in the NFL except like like Josh Gordon. And Kendall Wright. Um, so I, I was, uh, I like the more I watched Drake May, the more I liked. Um, I think his physical ability as a thrower is like just a smidge below Caleb, which is why mm-hmm. I've moved Caleb quarterback one. But, uh, you know, you're dealing with a guy who's already has experiencing like set, set, experience setting protections for an offensive line, having to produce in pretty difficult circumstances. And uh, I, I think he's going to be a guy like where, when he gets to play like with comparable talent to the opponent, it's going to be, it's going to look a little bit better for him. So like, dude, if I'm the Vikings, I know this isn't the mock draft show. If, if, if Drake may falls past two, like I'm giving yeah. heaven and earth to make that happen. Uh, Cause that's the oh, kind of man. guy I think that would jumpstart that offense and get them, get them back into the, the looking like a real future, looking like a real football team, maybe a little bit faster than the future looks right now. Yeah. And, and, May does feel a little landing spot sensitive to me. Like you, you tell me that he's w- in Minnesota behind an offensive line with a couple of pros, uh, with a coaching staff that I really like in Kevin O'Connell, and obviously he has Justin Jefferson and you know a couple other guys, Jordan Addison, T.J. Hawkinson when he's healthy. You know, Aaron Jones probably going to bring a run game. Like you tell me, he's in that landing spot. 
I'm in on Drake May. I mean, shoot, you even tell me he. I think he's perfect for Washington. If I'm if I'm right. the Commanders, I, I'm taking him second overall, and I'm not thinking twice about it. I think, and again, we'll get more into this with Classen, but I think he's perfect for that offense. And that's that is not just because I'm a Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson guy. Okay, it's not just because of that. But I think I really am scared they're going to talk themselves into into Jaden Daniels. But separate conversation, yeah. separate it's conversation. Sep- I could um, do a whole podcast on where the Commanders are right now because this kind of feels the same as the last thing you were doing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little little weird. Um, but on the flip side, if Drake May goes to New England at third overall, I can totally see how all of the Drake May kind of doubters and all that stuff, like they're going to get a lot of evidence, right? Because that is just a, a total project of a team. And right. I don't think he is ready to be dropped into that. And like, even though that's what he did in college, it's just doesn't always map from college to the NFL. I don't think he is the type of quarterback right now that you can just drop behind an- enemy lines and say, shoot your way out. I, I don't think he's there yeah. at this point. But the upside that, like you said, is so tremendous with him because when I when I watch him play, when I see how he reacts to pressure, when I see like the arm angles he's able to pull off when he un- like throwing under duress, that looks like an NFL quarterback to me. That looks like a top tier NFL quarterback to me. So it's just really hard to get away from because there, there's definitely things he needs to work on. I think there's footwork stuff he needs to work on. I think um, just overall, like, I don't want to use the capital P processing, but, like, I think he is a guy that when the first read's not there, sometimes it, it, it gets a little wonky for him if he if he can't kind of create under pressure. But these are, like, nitpicky things to me. The the, the good parts just really seem to outshine, uh, outshine the negative for me with Drake May. Nate's going to get you when you guys podcast next week. <laughs> he's he's like he's like the number one Drake May guy. I'm pretty sure he has Drake May. Very, is yeah, you can tell I'm very susceptible <laughs> to the peer pressure. Like right, like I'm already <laughs> I'm I already like, this close. I like I like Drake May. I don't like him as much as Nate, but he's gonna get your ass for some of these things yeah. you're saying. But no, I, I I I do see that. But I'm also kind of like I used to be a maybe you sit a guy, but I think as I've gotten older, I've I've fully become team just. Let's drop the charade. Just play them. Yeah. Unless they're really like, if they can't read the playbook, maybe you don't do that. But dude, I I always feel like I've got. I feel like the best way to get better at playing football is by playing football. You know, right. Lamar Jackson when he stepped in for Joe Flacco, he was not looking all that great for most of his games. But you saw some flashes enough that that gave you comfort that he could grow into something. And obviously, he's he's become an elite quarterback uh, in his own right. Dude, Josh Allen stunk, and oh, now he yeah. very much does not stink. I don't think you yeah. have to do any revisions, revisionist history with that. When he started playing, I thought he sucked, um, and you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. he doesn't suck now, so maybe that, maybe, maybe like you know, you just throw Drake May out there and see what happens. Although I wouldn't want any quarterback to end up in New England. Like I am right. yeah. rooting so hard for New England just to trade down out of three. Don't let any of the cool players in the draft get involved with whatever mess you have going on. That goes for Drake May. That goes for Marvin Harrison. That goes for Romo Dooms. <sighs> Just trade down and take a tackle, okay? Take a for tackle. The be- for the hey, betterment please. of the league. For the betterment of the league, just take a tackle, all right? <laughs> Literally, for, I mean, shoot, bro, this is a fantasy podcast, okay? I mean, eh, sort of, kind of. But it is it is in name a fantasy show, right? Uh, for all of us that care about fantasy or dynasty, like, we are, we do not want anyone that we like in New England. Not, and that, listen, New England, can it can all work out eventually. But yes, please, tackle. Like, take a tackle. Rebuild that offensive line. That's what we're hoping for here from the selfish perspective. But yes. okay. Okay, so clearly I'm I'm very close to you know to to, Come on. to taking the peer pressure on Drake. Come in May. The I'm very close. <laughs> I'm very close. So yeah, Nate Nate might uh, that that'll be an interesting one when we when we do the mock draft show. Uh, I hope he has something there with with Drake May. But let's talk about Jaden Daniels. Um, and okay, so you so you are you think there's a pretty clear drop off between these top two guys down to Jaden Daniels. I have a lot of Jaden Daniels thoughts as well. So you hit me with yours first. Um. I don't think that his reps of playing like difficult football are all that impressive. Like when the pocket collapses and, you know, Malik Neighbors hasn't beat someone by 10 yards down the field or Brian Thompson, Thomas isn't, you know, five yards wide open in the end zone by himself because no cornerback who's 
just there for a degree can keep keep can keep up with him. So that's really where where I get concerned with uh, with Jaden and and you know like w- when the pocket gets muddy, I don't think he always has like the physical attributes to kind of shine through that because even though like he's he's a he's a guy that's gotten a lot of uh, big plays on the field, huge chunk plays. Already talked about before, he was by far the most productive player in college football last year. Um, from passing and running standpoint, uh, just an absolute dynamite weapon. But I just get a little concerned with like how his game translates because you didn't see him have to do a whole lot of difficult things that you see NFL quarterbacks have to do every single Sunday. So that makes me concerned. And also, <laughs> I know that it, it's kind of a meme at this point, like when you watch him, but he just doesn't take care of his body at all on oh. the field. And it, it's just, man, you're okay. He didn't weigh in at the combine. That's always a nope. bad sign. That's always a bad sign. Cause even guys like Bryce Young, Kyler Murray, uh, Zach Wilson, guys where you have concerns about their weight, they still come to the combine. They still, you know, you, 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 you slug some water, you eat some steak at Harry and Izzy's, and then you go stand on the scale and you don't run. But the fact that he didn't test, didn't weigh in, uh, that makes me a little bit concerned because he is a more slender guy. Um, and I think he's probably around 190 pounds. And uh, for people who don't know this about Jaden, he has gained like 40 or 50 pounds since he started his college journey. And he's about 190. Wow. So how much can you realistically put on more than that without, you know, getting into some uh, alternative methods of weight gain and strength gain, which end you up on the commissioner's exempt list? Uh, I uh, I just get a little worried for, you know, for all those reasons. But still, I, I do think the floor is pretty high. Um, I mean, look at guys like Jalen Hurts, not the most polished yeah. passer out there. But when you can run and you can throw a deep ball, you can start there as building an offense. I think I think with Jaden, it's going to be I wouldn't be surprised if the rookie contract years are really successful for him as a team can kind of build around him. But I would already be concerned. And it sounds so crazy to say this, like five weeks before he's even drafted. But I would be a little concerned like what that team looks like once they start paying him big money down the road. Like the yeah. Eagles. No. <laughs> I, you, you said the name Jalen Hurts and like that immediately clicked for me too because you can't, you cannot watch 2023 Eagles film and not come away. And like if you have an honest, just, unbiased eye you can't come away from it and think like yeah you know what the quarterback's kind of limiting this offense a little bit they, he's not the only problem there are there were structural problems with that offense too but how much of that structure is because that's what the quarterback can do um and i hate to be that guy because like i mean i love jalen hurts and like i think he's the man and like i i root for jalen hurts success but it's just the reality of what that offense was last year and you know maybe he can develop and continue whatever but uh, man yeah I, some of the things you said about Jaden daniels really do ring true for me because he is an easy player to like yes. uh, you know if you just if like you said you watch him on saturdays d- you get a couple beers in you you might be ready to proclaim he's like the best player that's ever played you watch his highlights like you do a breakdown of his highlights or something like that you're gonna go crazy about uh, about the just what he can do um and but then he's funny because it's not like anthony richardson last year where the high highs were so high but then you see even in the dark moments like oh man yeah th- th- this is this is not so great but there are some real things to build on there with Jaden it's different because it's like even when he's having some of the success when you really dive into it you think like you know there's a lot of stuff here that just I- I'm concerned about mapping to the NFL um, most pr- particularly to me is just the middle of the field passing is just like not there um, right. it, it, so much of what he's doing with Malik neighbors, um, is like these slot fades. Uh, that's where he's getting a lot of production. Um, like, and, and there's a lot of plays where Malik neighbors is streaking wide open in the middle of the field and he's taking the go ball or the outside, the numbers route to Brian Thomas It's just not. And look, maybe that's just the offense at LSU is running. I, I don't really know, but it was a little striking to me just how, absent that middle of the field area was for for Jaden Daniels on film this year yeah it's a it's an interesting spot for him I I I think him more than any other player any other quarterback is like landing spot specific to me 
Um, because he's gonna need some things around him. And and dude, I I I see him try to run over like defensive tackles occasionally. I see him try to run over linebackers. Um, he's scrambled yeah. more than like any quarterback has in the pro football focus era. I I just feel mm-hmm. like he he doesn't play a game that's conducive towards just quite frankly like just making it through a season. Um, oh yeah, like yeah. you said, it was a meme, man. But like he gets himself crushed, crushed, like it, Looney Tunes it's, level it's, hits, dude. Yes, yeah, like very, um, very Wiley e. Coyote esque. Yeah, where, you know, like just smacking into the wall. And he he's got the straight line speed. Like he's definitely got the oh, straight yeah. line speed. But I don't think like he doesn't have the wiggle of like a Lamar Jackson does. And he's not as big, like physically big as like Justin Fields is. Even though I think like their straight line speed might be somewhat comparable. I, I would I would just wait to see where he gets drafted before I get invested. Cause I, I know that yeah. he's I, I think he's a first round player. I think he's a first round prospect. Trading up to like three for him, that's a bit rich to me. I'd rather just see if he falls because um I don't I don't know like how high the upside is with him considering his age. He's played a bunch of college football and he might be maxed out at like 190 pounds. Yeah, I mean, he's listed on the internet at 210. No. No way. No, no way. Um, <laughs> I'll ta- no, I will take no, the under no on the real no scale shot. on 210. Um, but, yeah, it's it's fascinating because, and again, we'll talk about this next week with Derek Klassen about, like, particularly quarterback fits with these top three teams. I can I can sort of get my head around where Washington with, I mean, freaking Cliff Kingsbury and, like, these receivers where they can kind of tell themselves that they're a Jaden Daniels team. I can I can get there. It's not what I would do. I can get there with them. Um I think he's a player that's like definitely a top 10 pick quarterback. Uh it's just I think that maxed out term does sort of not just with the weight and the frame but also just with his game a little bit. Like I I can I can totally see what you're saying there about like he's a first contract player. Not that he's going to flame out, but just, again, it might be a little more difficult to build when he's on that second contract. But hey, I'll tell you what, for for fantasy, for dynasty, this guy's going to run. He's going to put up production oh, as yeah. a rusher. I mean, that that he's going to be um, a great, I think he's going to be a great fantasy draft pick. And if he does land in a situation like Washington with those receivers, or I mean Minnesota, God forbid he ends up in Minnesota. I think we're gonna have to converse, have a conversation about how he and his game impacts these receivers. But we're we're gonna be having a pretty fun conversation about what Jan, Jaden Daniels can do as a producer on the field. So interesting. Okay, that's the top three guys. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about the rest of the quarterbacks, the you know, especially the highly drafted guys. Right after this. All right, Charles, we're back. Let's talk about the guy that I grouped into kind of a tier of his own here and just called it the draft season riser. And that is J.J. McCarthy. I have seen people push back on this idea that he is just a postseason meteoric riser. You know, I know Dane Brugler has said that he had teams hyped up about him like back in August. The the teams have been excited about J.J. McCarthy for a while. So where are you with J.J. McCarthy? Is this a guy that is just a, hey, we got a shortage of quarterbacks and this is, this is a first round worthy player, so we're pushing him up. Or does he kind of deserve to be talked about in this way? Uh, he's like a JJ McCarthy is like a, a Rorschach test to me, hmm. where I think you can kind of see whatever you want in him. Uh, I I just get concerned, man. Like obviously we 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 have been we've been familiar with Jim Harbaugh as an NFL coach for a, or as, as not an NFL coach, a football coach for a long time. Um, and whether it's Stanford, San Francisco 49ers, Michigan Wolverines, he's going to want to run the ball. Um, mm-hmm. And he's been extremely successful at running the ball every single place that he's coached. So I don't know how much of the tasks that J.J. McCarthy was asked to do has to do with him or has to do more with this is how Jim Harbaugh is going to play regardless. But I do find it a little bit interesting. Like you start watching these games, it's like, man, they never asked him to do anything. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it, it's a lot of like, <laughs> the, the, even the passing stuff, like there's a lot of short passes or stuff where guys are open down the field. And I just get a little concerned. Like this is a guy who hasn't had to carry the weight for a college football team 
a little bit. Like maybe there's a game here or there where he's got to make some big plays. Like the Ohio State game, I thought he had some nice plays. A couple times in the Penn State game, there were moments that he had. But, you know, these moments are pretty few and far between just based on how good Michigan was last year. You're never really playing from a deficit, partially because they refuse to schedule anybody good at the start of the season and they don't play anybody real until like, you know, the 11th or 12th week of the season. That's a yeah. whole different rant for another day. Go dogs. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I just find it a little bit baffling for me when I'm trying to evaluate him. It's like, man, like he's not a bad quarterback, but I don't see anything here that would make me say, or I don't see anything consistently enough. I should say mm-hmm. that would make me sure. feel comfortable if I'm the Vikings packaging 11, 23 plus a 20, 20, 25 first to get up there to draft him. That's a big, big spin to me for a guy who hasn't really shown all of that much in terms of high end talent. But I will say this, he's got some arm talent. Mm-hmm. Um, he can throw down the fields. Uh, I think he's got, you know, a nice arm that can put some heat on the ball, put some accuracy and he's, he's a baby. Like he's only 20 or 21. So there's a lot of room for him to like physically grow uh, a lot of room for him to grow like mentally as a football player, conceptually as a football player. But I just haven't seen it enough yet where I would feel like making a, I would feel comfortable making a big investment. You know, if, if he were to just fall to my pick, you know, and I'm, you know, even, even if, like say, this is a hit, say this is a world where the Falcons hadn't signed Kirk Cousin and he drops the eighth pick. I think that's fine because yeah. you could still, you could still get a quarterback, but packaging the assets to go get him is what makes me a little bit nervous because they just didn't ask him to do a whole bunch in the football field. Yeah, it's weird because the conversation, th- this is where I think people get this like, okay, he's just a, a draft season kind of riser uh, idea with JJ because it's been, it's gone from, hey, the Vikings might take this guy in the first round. Like they might, they might take this guy in the first round to the Vikings might trade three first round picks to jump up to the third or fourth overall pick to take this guy. Like that's where the conversation has jumped, like kind of jumped the shark here a little bit because it, it would be very similar to the Trey Lance trade if they did this. And, and not to mention, like, I kind of think this is going to sound weird because they don't play the game the same at all. But I kind of think he is a little bit of a Trey Lance sort of proposition here um, because I think J.J. McCarthy in a weird way is kind of a developmental quarterback. Like you mentioned, he's so young. Um, he hasn't been asked to do a lot. Like there's not a lot of reps. I think the reps that you get if you package them all together are. Because he's the one guy I haven't watched any. Re- I haven't done a lot of work on Michigan receivers, so I had to actually like sit down and really watch him in isolation. After a while, you tend you can kind of get it. Like you can get there with JJ McCarthy. So, in a, but in a weird way, like I said, he's a developmental player without that sort of like you know what if he hits, man, he's gonna be like a supernova type of player, like a Trey Lance was. If Trey Lance had hit. He has all that talent. Like you could tell yourself he has top five quarterback talent. I don't know that JJ McCarthy has top five quarterback in the league ceiling, but I think he has like a Kirk Cousins, like a, and I'm not saying Kirk Cousins at the beginning of his career, like Kirk Cousins the last few years in Minnesota when he was a super productive player and they were winning a lot of games. Like I think he does have that upside. I'm just wondering like how fast it's going to take for him to get there. Right. Right. And and that's, that's the whole question of like of drafting him, you know, because Mm-hmm. You, you don't really have a timetable on when it's going to get to him. Cause I remember, man, the Alabama game that they played, you know, a lot of people were walking out of the game saying, okay, Michigan won, uh, but it had nothing to do with their quarterback play. And honestly, their quarterback play kind of anchored them a little bit at times of their game. And even you, you get to the Washington game, they just ran over them and, and beat them up yeah. on defense. Uh, I, I, I just struggle with his projection because you know, maybe he is a super talented guy, but it hasn't been actualized in a way that should make you feel comfortable saying this guy's going to be the future face of our franchise. Um, I, 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 I really don't really know where to put with put, where to put him. Uh, I imagine you know when we're doing the draft grades, I'll just cop out and give whoever drafts him a B minus and say, hey, keep him. Moving. You needed a quarterback. <laughs> you needed a quarterback. You drafted one. That's, that's all I got for you. All right. Well, I think that uh, where we have JJ in this conversation kind of reflects that, right? Where he's in his own little group here where I think we can we can see a first round quarterback here for sure. It's just what are you giving up for for that guy? Let's talk about the other two guys that 
sort of I put them in kind of wild cards in the group here because sometimes you do see Michael Penix and Bo Nix mocked in the first round. Other times they're more second round pick type of players. Let's start with Michael Penix, who I've seen a lot of because I've watched a lot of these Washington receivers. Um, I, I'll give you my thoughts before and you tell me if you think this is right. To me, there's always one guy every draft season that I feel like, you know what, if this was 1995, I think they'd be a top tier quarterback in the league. And I kind of feel like that's Michael Penix to me, where um, when he's just able to sit back there and be like a javelin thrower and just heave that thing, it looks really nice. When we get off script, maybe not as nice. Then then we're sort of in the situation where why does Roma Dunze have all these contested catches? Well, <laughs> Michael Penny's kind of throwing him into some of those contested catches. Because <laughs> yeah. let me tell you, Rome is not a guy that oh, he struggles to separate. No, not at all. Great, great route runner, great separator, a lot of contested catches. Usually that comes back to the quarterback play. So um, that's kind of my overall thoughts on Michael Penix. Where are you with him? Uh, yeah, I, I, I like the javelin thing because I've been calling him the trebuchet quarterback. You know, if you can just <laughs> yeah. build a wall. Give him time to, you know, stretch out the arm and fling it down the sideline. You can get some, uh, you you can get some pretty spectacular plays from him. And I, I do think he has the arm. He has the arms to like, get him drafted. But man, I don't know. The more I watch, I just more. The more I watch Washington's offense, the more I came away with appreciation for their receivers than oh, the yeah. quarterback. Like Odunes is a beast. I think Polk and McMillian are, are good players in their own right. I, I just think with with, with Penix, it, it it's just gonna take way too much around him for him to be like that guy. Like you you need a you need like an ace offensive line, which so few teams have uh right. in the NFL. There's there's maybe less than five teams where you would say, Oh, <clears throat> you know, that offensive line is someone that I can count on to just steamroll people every single week. Um so I I I I see why people get excited, especially during the season, but Honestly, I think the Michigan game is really all you need to see for him. Mm. You know, when when you stack the you stack the talent, Michigan can Michigan can confidently go out there and say, we can match you player for player in terms of secondary. Because even Michigan they have a, a cornerback, Will Johnson, who's one of those guys that could probably sit out this season and go top ten next year. Mm. Um, they got beat up up front, and you can just see the playmaking is not quite there. Um, and like you said, 1995 quarterback, he's like, he's, he's gone, he's like gone uh, in, in reverse on part of the uh, quarterback evolution cycle. All of these guys can run. All these guys can make plays by themselves. He doesn't really do that. And I, I think that that's, I think it's going to hurt him on draft day. Like, I don't really think he's going to end up going in the first round. Uh, I think he's probably more of a day two guy due to that. And also he had three back to back to back season in injuries while he was at right. Indiana and he's an older prospect. That's probably a little maxed out. Um, fun player to watch at times, but I don't really think he's a great prospect. Yeah. Colin, uh, producer Colin, the chat said it's, it's kind of like the antithesis of CJ Stroud in Georgia where like that CJ Stroud, Georgia game, like, man, there he is like creating like there, th there it all is like, it's, it's right there. If you, if you think he can do this and by the way, it turned out in the NFL, he could do this. <laughs> he could do that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Every he, week. Could, he could do it. <laughs> that, didn't have to. Hey, he did it against, did it against the best defense in the NFL, uh, the best defense in college football, best team in college football. He did it there. Oh, well, let me tell you, he gets to the NFL. He can do it. Okay, great. Um, whereas it was kind of the opposite there with Michael Penix, where the week before the Michigan game, you started to see mock drafts of him like, oh, he's going eighth overall to your Falcons. He could go eighth overall to the Falcons. Now you don't re you rarely see him in first round mocks. He's more of like a, a round two type of guy. And it is interesting because I, I, I can totally see where people like him and I can totally see. I can I can envision a successful Michael Penix season. I don't know if I can envision like a he's your franchise quarterback, but. I can I can build the build the wall, <laughs> build the wall with him, put it in front of him, give him a couple good receivers, and I can see where he can go to work for for a year as like a, a a fringe starter type of player. But because he's an older prospect, because there's the the maxed out kind of idea with him too, I don't know if I see like him as a guy that you take in round two and you think you're going to develop, you know, or something like that. It just feels like he's a guy. If you get if you're the right team and you take him, maybe he could be a day one starter for you, and and you can get a crazy like lightning in the bottle type season with him. I guess. 
You know what I really have grown to hate over the past few years? It's like the people who grab video of a left-handed quarterback and flip it to right-handed. Like, oh, well, does your chance his perception of Michael Penix or Tua now? No. 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 <laughs> you, you, you just flip the video around. <laughs> yeah, I could, it, couldn't it, care less. Mahomes, I'll tell you, you make Pat Mahomes left-handed, I'm still going to be going, oh my God, this is insane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I we should dude, we should start doing that. We should be the guys that flip Pat Mahomes left hand and be like, see, this was not that impressive, right? <laughs> like system quarterback. <laughs> oh, you hate this now because it's left handed? Yeah. What, the, what are we yeah, what are we talking about? Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, so, that's that's a great one. Someone did it with the Michael Penix like combine throws, but I was like, I don't think anyone was really hating too hard on how he threw at the combine. Had a had a decent session. I mean, it wasn't great for really any of the quarterbacks uh, at the combine. But you know, I don't really see. It's, it's funny how people get caught up in that. It's like, no, I think maybe people just don't think he's that good because he's not that good. There's nothing to do with him yeah. being left-handed. This is not the discrimination you're looking for. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, left-handed folks. You're not a marginalized people when it comes to quarterbacking. I mean, that's right. If you're good, if you're if you're good, you're good. I don't know. I like I said, I can envision a scenario where Michael Penix has some good moments in the NFL. Um, but I do I definitely see the downside here as well. Let's talk about Bo Nix. Um I mm. t- tell you what, buddy, I don't know a lot about Bo Nix, so you, you tell me. <laughs> um well, I've been to pat myself on the shoulder, very personal moment. I've been patting myself uh, with a little victory lap because, so for those who don't know, I'm a huge Georgia Bulldogs fan. Like I watch every game. Right. That's the team where I get to feel joy. I don't like, I don't like them as much as, I'm not as emotionally attached to them as I am the Falcons, but you know, bad still. Decision. You should, you bad decision. Maybe try to be. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm, wor- I'm working on it. I'm working on it. But the Georgia, that's my team. Don't miss the game. I've seen a lot of them uh, play over the years. Bo Nix was a quarterback at Auburn for three years, and he was a legacy freshman starter that was forced to transfer to Oregon because he was not good enough to play at Auburn. Now, he walks into a better situation at Oregon, gets to play a little bit of an easier schedule, especially his first year, but more importantly, gets to play with a whole lot better players than he did uh, at Auburn because the the spot where Dan Lanning has Oregon is a much better spot than where whoever the hell was coaching Auburn. I've lost track of how many coaches they've had uh, during the Bo Nix years. But at the same time, you know, Bo Nix was not an impressive player at Auburn himself. Like, he's someone that needed a lot of help for things to go right for him. So, you know, I'm I'm chatting with my friends. And they're like, uh, this Bo Nix stuff, this Bo Nix stuff, like, he's putting up numbers. Maybe he's a guy. I was like, guys, he's Bo Nix. Okay. He's Bo Nix. You've seen this for five years. Like, how, mu- how much more do you need to see? And at the end of the day, people start coming back to like, oh, yeah, he's small. It's a pretty lim- limited passer. Doesn't push the ball downfield a whole lot uh, into tight windows. And, you know, he, he's just not someone I, I don't think offers a whole lot at the NFL level outside of being like a, a spot starter, high level backup type. Uh, yeah. Could he have like a Baker Mayfield year that Baker just had a few years down the road? Maybe. But even then, I think Baker's a more physically gifted passer than than Bo Nix is. I, I've been trying to come up with a good comparison for Bo Nix, and like I came around to like like Matt Castle somewhere around there, where you feel really good about him being your backup. But if he's your starter for an extended amount of time, it might go pretty poorly for you. Yeah, he'll be twenty four year old rookie. Um, so definitely again, not a guy that you can sit there and say like we're going to develop him type of thing. Um, I I can see that though, just based on what I've I've read of him and what I've seen of him, like a high end backup at some point might be in his future. So I definitely don't don't think that's a guy you can really take in the first round. But I mean, if you spend a second third round pick on a backup quarterback, like definitely teams are going to be or some fans are going to hate it. Um, but until your quarterback gets hurt, so you yeah, so your quarterback gets hurt, and at least you got a guy who can go in there. And be functional. All right. Um, last group of quarterbacks here. Uh, look, like non th- these guys, not first round picks, probably not gonna be second round picks, maybe not even third round picks. Spencer Rattler, Michael Pratt, Sam Hartman, um, Joe Milton, Jordan Travis, any of these guys, or anyone else I didn't mention that, that you find particularly interesting. Oh man. Um the only one I haven't seen on this list is uh Michael Pratt. Um, so I have no takes on him. But Spencer Rattler is interesting because mm-hmm. 
at one point, he was like credibly projected to be the first pick in like maybe like the 2023 or 2022 NFL draft. Um, right. Then, you know, the guy who's at the top of the draft came in and kind of made that a little bit messy for Spencer. And Spencer has had some uh, off the field stuff that I think teams are concerned about uh, in terms of like just <laughs> being totally invested into what's going on. Like if I'm, if I am uh if I'm a if I'm a scout or a GM, I'm kind of looking at Spencer Rattler's uh combine and be like, why are you running a five second forty? You're not that slow. <laughs> you know, yeah. why are you testing like one of the least athletic quarterbacks that's come out in a long time when, you know, right, we've seen him play before. He's not quite that bad when when he's in shape and he's running around. So um the arm talent's definitely interesting. The skill level is interesting. I think he did some nice things in South Carolina, but he's got some other things to answer for. Sam Hartman, man, just watch the Senior Bowl. Uh, Joe Milton, <laughs> Joe man, Milton. Say, Sam Hartman, handsome guy though. Handsome guy. Handsome guy. I, look, if I'm Sam Hartman, I think I can make more money modeling than playing quarterback in the NFL. To be quite honest with you, um, <laughs> hey, what, what a stud! Saw, saw him, saw him at Super Bowl Media Week. I think we interviewed him right at, at Amazing Yahoo. Hair. I think. Fit, Fitz, amazing hair. Saw him at the Zach Bryan concert later in, that week in Vegas. He was not the only quarterback there. Uh, he was not the only quarterback there, but he was definitely the most sober quarterback there. Uh, yeah. I will say that about the Zach <laughs> Bryan concert. Uh, but hey, saw him there. Handsome guy. Hell of a handsome guy. Agree. Maybe maybe if quarterbacking's not for him, maybe modeling is for him. But no, what, go on about uh, jo- Joe Milton. Uh, Joe Milton to me is baffling because. That to me is the exact type of person that should be participating in the NFL combine, but he didn't. Yeah. Um, which was really, really strange to me because look, man, I, I'm going to be sensitive here because this is an in- issue that I've talked about for a long time, but you are not Lamar Jackson. All right. You're not Lamar Jackson to the point where if you go and run that 40 at the combine, someone might say, oh, yeah, we've seen you play quarterback. You might want to play wide receiver or something. Joe Milton, maybe you, you want to think about a position switch at the NFL level. Maybe you do. Maybe you could Logan Thomas it. I could understand yeah. why someone doesn't want to do that because playing tight end is not as fun as playing quarterback. But Joe, we've kind of all seen you play quarterback at two different spots. You got beat out by J.J. McCarthy, which sent you to Tennessee. Couldn't get past Hennon Hooker on the depth chart. And then you got to play this year in what's supposed to be one of like the most wide open offenses and he didn't produce all that much. Now, Joe Milton, I think Joe Milton, if he was standing 20 yards away from me, he could decapitate me with the football. Like that's how strong his arm is. But yeah. it might take him a- 150 tries before he gets close to my head, which is kind of the problem with where Joe Milton is. So I thought if I was Joe Milton, yeah, I'll go out to the combine. I'll... Go run a low, you know, a high four fives, and then I'll throw the ball, I throw the ball, and it touches the ceiling, and I can build some hype that way. But the fact that he did nothing was was pretty baffling to me, uh, and especially because he's the guy that might want to open up his options once he gets to the NFL in terms of, of in terms of what he can actually do. Uh, Jordan Travis, uh, not really a prospect to me, and he also has one leg, so. Uh, yeah, when you like, when you watch the FSU tape, uh, Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson, I think a lot of their their jobs made tougher by Jordan Travis. That was a good pickup for Florida State in terms of like stabilizing their quarterback position. But as far as an NFL guy, I don't I don't think he's got any juice there at all. Yeah, I've got my questions about Keon Coleman uh, as an NFL receiver. We'll obviously yeah. talk about that in a couple of weeks. But there's no question that quarterback play definitely made his life more difficult than it needed to be on film. No question about that. All right. Well, that makes it seem like to me, Charles, that it's a pretty good group up at the top, but maybe there's not a ton of like intriguing depth beyond, you know, once we get once we get past the Michael Penix, Bo Nix range and you weren't even that all that jazzed up about that range, to be honest, it does seem like this class doesn't have maybe the best depth in the world. But see, I'm also kind of a snob when it comes to this stuff. Like I have been. If I can't get a quarterback in the first round, I'll find a vet. So I'll find a veteran that someone else has already developed and you can come, you know, be a little Jacoby Brissett for a year or two and, and we'll figure something out. I, I I personally just don't feel a need to 
like if I was running a team to burn a, a second or third round pick on on Bo, Bo Nix or Michael Penix, that's yeah. just it doesn't make sense to me. So, you know, I, I always look at these quarterback drafts like there's three and a half that I would draft this year. Um, or I guess four, you know, if we're going to treat them. Uh, J.J. McCarthy is a whole person. There's four quarterbacks I'll draft this year, two in the top five, and then two more in the first round. Yeah, it was very funny last season when our last draft season when a bunch of these guys like went on day three. There was like a run on them because and then the league's like everybody's trying to find the next Brock Purdy. I'm like, what is it? Ninety nine percent chance you are ninety nine point nine percent chance you are not gonna do that. Dude. You are not gonna find the next Brock and, Purdy. And, so like you're and you're gonna find to, the next Tommy DeVito. What happened to the 49ers that forced them to start Brock Purdy? Broken leg and another yeah. quarterback injury, and then you found out. Oh wow. This guy who was the last pick in the draft, the last pick in the draft, nobody wanted this guy, uh, turns out to be a, you know, a, a capable quarterback in his own right. And even then, everyone's just like, how much are you going to pay him? Because yeah, <laughs> well, if you believe if you believe a very boozed up Kyle Shanahan at media night, he was actually saying that he's the best. He was the best quarterback in training camp to the owner after the after his rookie season. So yeah, I mean, but sure. Again, not a sober sure Kyle Shanahan. So yeah. Yeah, and and I mean, yeah, that's ridiculous. To, I, I just don't believe him that, that that was true at the time, but it doesn't matter because he's here now. He's here now. That's all that matters. All right. Well, Charles, you have been here now uh, and we appreciate you for this quarterback breakdown. Hell of uh, work on this one, man. Quarterbacks are interesting. These these guys are particularly fascinating to talk about up top, as always. Every, all of this analysis can be thrown in the trash once they get drafted by certain teams. And, you know, then that that is where we'll really find out about the future of those players. Yeah. Charles is going to hopefully join us on draft night to break down the actual landing spots for these players. So that should be exciting. But for in the meantime, Charles, tell the people out there what you're working on, what they can go check out this week. Uh, let's see. So me and uh, Nate Tyrus, we're going to put out another mock draft later today. I uh, got a four verse column coming at some point today and yeah, I'll be back next Thursday. You can listen to my podcast, the exempt list where we're, we're kind of talking about the same things, but it doesn't matter uh, on. <laughs> hey, it, it, it's, it's March. My man. God, sell it a little bit better. It, it, no, it's, a different, it's March. It's, man. It, it, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel, but if you like to have fun, uh, maybe you don't mind uh, a handful of bleeps per episode with your football analysis and, some off the beaten path conversations, then yeah, come check out the exempt list on Tuesdays. Uh, but yeah, we're, 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 you know, we're trying to just get to the draft, get to the draft. I, you know, I was yeah. thinking during this, maybe we should have someone that's not you or me, maybe someone whose name also starts with a C and their last name starts with a B go back through the episodes from last year and see how terrible we were on some of our takes about the pre-draft prospects. I, I don't know if we want that. I, I think there are things I may have regretted saying, but it's it's, oh, but it's, hard I, it's to tell. funny. It's funny. Like I've gotten a little taste funny. exposed. I, I thought it was hilarious. Oh, I mean, especially on draft stuff, it's like, come on. I, I I've seen some some people on the internet this week be like, analysts should be more accountable and all this stuff. It's like, yo, this this is the hardest thing uh to talk about. Oh, Colin said he has pro some. Train. Oh, I'm sure I'm sure Colin says we hit on sixty five percent. You know what? If we're batting sixty five percent, buddy, hire me then. NFL, I'm yeah. open for. <laughs> we're doing good. We're doing good. All right, well, people out there, as we wait for those takes to be exposed, definitely make sure you're subscribed to Charles's podcast, The Exempt Lifts, on the Zero Blitz feed here at Yahoo Sports, and make sure you're checking out that mock draft because it'll get you primed for Monday when we are back with Nate Tice to kick off our mock draft Monday series here leading up to the NFL draft until then we're out. <laughs>